And Chris, these last few weeks, no buys. We got 16 games. And we got Saturday football this week. We got two Saturday games. Let's try to get through Thursday night, Saturday, and the 1 o'clock games on Sunday in this segment. And we're going to get right it. to it. Your guy, Johnny Gruden, hosting the Los Angeles Chargers. The Las Vegas Raiders desperately need to win or it will be time to put a fork in them. Three-point favorites are the Raiders, over under 53 and a half, highest of the week. What do you think happens? Well, I, I, I go back and forth here. And, you know, yes, he's my guy. Apparently, he's not your guy if anybody watched Pro Football Talk uh, uh, Thursday morning because uh, Mike Florio, he went after John Gruden pretty hard, just to, to put that out there. But either way, uh, it is an intriguing matchup. Thursday night football is always a little weird. The Raiders got issues. I don't know what to think of this football game, Mike. I really don't. I'd like to think the Raiders are going to be the more desperate team, haven't played well, figure out a way to right the ship. But, man, you fire a defensive coordinator. You know, they got injuries. We know they got other guys, you know, on the COVID list and all of that to where I am worried about them, let alone, like we talked about on the show this morning, the Chargers are very talented. I mean, you could go through position by position and probably give the Chargers the advantage in a lot of the matchups. So that's where I go back and forth with this. But I think at the end of the day, I'm just going to trust Gruden and Derek Carr more than I am Anthony Lynn and Justin Herbert, who's a young rookie quarterback. Gruden has shown against this Gus Bradley defense, he can kind of slowly but surely find ways to pick it apart. I think they'll be able to run the ball with Josh Jacobs being back. I really went back and forth here. I'm going to go Raiders 23 to 20 to win this football game tonight. The spread's three. Do you want to give someone oh, an extra point or take a point away? I'll get, I will go Raiders 24 to 20 to make sure. So I'm on the Raiders all the way here. Yeah, and look, despite everything I said during PFT Live, and I got some interesting feedback via email from possibly a John Gruden burner account. We'll never know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the text of the email that I received, but I stand by what I said. And with all that said, I agree with you. Desperation is a difference maker in December. The Chargers aren't playing for anything. I don't think the players are sufficiently motivated to play for Anthony Lynn's job or they would have been playing better earlier in the year. I think the Raiders win because they have to. I'm concerned about the losses on defense. Guys like yes. Jonathan Abram and Damon Arnett not available. I'm concerned about the absence of Henry Ruggs. But at the same time, I like the fact that the Raiders desperately need it. Derek Carr has shown flashes this year. If they're ever going to do it, they're doing it now. 27-20, the Raiders tonight. And if they lose, trust me, Chris, tomorrow morning on PFT Live, while you're off and I'm doing the show, you can tune in and hear a stream of profanities bleeped out that I direct to John Gruden if he makes me wrong on Thursday night. I think I've been wrong the last two or three straight Thursday nights. So come on, Gruden, suck it up and win a game. All right, well, Saturday Thursday football. is tough. It is tough. And uh, just to ac echo that, your point about the DBs, that's the real thing. You know, that's what scares me, and that's why I wasn't sure. Because those Chargers, we know Justin Herbert, his arm, those receivers, that could be dangerous and poised for an up, uh, an upset that way. But sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, that's fine. And, and the latest update that we saw Thursday morning is that both Keenan Allen and Mike Williams for the Chargers are game-time decisions, so we don't know whether yeah. or not there will be that mismatch. And, and I still trust the team that's desperate. When all else fails, bet on the team that is more desperate to get to the postseason or at least keep their postseason hopes alive. Saturday football, Buffalo Bills, six-point favorites at Denver. The Bills in the middle of this run where they play in primetime. They're looking good. They're stepping up at the right time. The Broncos, who knows what they have, although they managed to beat the Panthers on the road last week. Over under 49 and a half. Chris, who do you like? Well, okay, I like the Bills, obviously. I mean, the Bills are playing really good football. We know that. They, they, for me, have jumped into the Super Bowl conversation. We've discussed that a few times over the last few weeks. The defense, you know, really, last five or six weeks, I don't know where it statistically ranks over that time period, but I would bet you it's up there as one of the better defenses in football, top 10, top 12, that way. We know how special the offense is. Carol, I mean, uh, excuse me, the Broncos are dangerous, though, in a lot of ways. You know, first off, we saw Vic Fangio knows how to shut down high-octane, throw-first type offenses. He gave Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City offense issues. They couldn't get in the end zone, right? A lot of field goals and that. 
you know, Buffalo, I mentioned the defense being better, but man, the Denver offense has been better too. And, you know, I think they're going to be able to make some plays. Sean McDermott's going to be in a little bit of a bind here because the Broncos have enough of a run game where you have to worry about that. And Drew Locke, even though he's young and makes his mistakes here and there, just like we saw last week, he's going to stress you out as the defensive coordinator because he's going to attack KJ, KJ Hamler, you know, deep throws to Jerry Judy. They're going to they're gonna push the ball. It's hard to defend. I'm going to take the Bills, but I'm going to take it 24 to 20 here. I think this is going to be a pretty close football game. Uh, look, uh, I agree with you, and I – I uh I could sense where you were going. We've been doing this long enough now. I know which way the wind's blowing. I was getting ready to do the gesture of of somebody trying to thread a needle because I knew that was coming. You were going to take the Bills to win, the Broncos to cover. I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to well, not as it relates to who's going to win. Obviously, we're going to pick the Bills at this point, but I like the Broncos to lose this one by more than six points. Bills thirty, Broncos seventeen. I just think the Bills have reached a level that we haven't seen from them in a long time. And they're within reach of their first division title since 1995. I think they're going to grab it come Saturday. The Saturday night cap, Carolina Panthers at the Green Bay Packers. We've seen issues with the Packers having sufficient energy in these home. The fans aren't present, although they had a limited smattering the last time they played at home. Packers favored by nine against the Panthers, who really have nothing to play for. Packers trying to get the one seed. Chris, who do you like? Well, I mean, what a Saturday. I mean, you kidding? I get to watch my boy Blue, and then I get to watch old Aaron Rodgers. I mean, that's a great day for me. I, I really am, am excited about it. Um, Green Bay is playing really good football right now. Carolina, you said it. It's a young team. It's the end of the year. They're not playing great. They're out of it. I do feel like the defenses have caught on to their offense a little bit. The fact that Christian McCaffrey is not there, I think it's finally caught up to them, too, to just have that one less avenue to play with defenses and trick them that way. And Carolina, we saw last week, you know, Drew Locke and that offense in Denver had their way with that defense. So I think from that aspect, the way your Vikings, you know, made a few plays on the Carolina Panthers, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Jones, the running game coming back, I think this is a not an easy win but certainly a, a, a – dom- I don't know what do I want to say. 31-20 Packers. I'm just trying to – I don't want to say it's easy, but the game is never like, oh, the Packers might lose the football game. I think they'll control it with, from, with, from without, from within, hey, whatever had, the hell I'm trying to say. We had Aaron Rodgers earlier this week appearing with Pat McAfee claiming that the Packers are playing great. Now, part of me thinks they're maybe walking into a trap by being that confident, but I'm not going to pick against the Packers as they are within reach of the number one seed. I think they've ironed out this issue of not having sufficient energy when they play at home. And I think some fans, better than no fans at all, in the last time they played at home, they did have a little bit more right out of the gates against the Bears on that Sunday night of Thanksgiving weekend. I like the Packers 37-23. I'm going all in with the Packers down the stretch. I'm still not confident they won't gack at some point in the playoffs, but at least down the stretch as they have that one seed in sight, they're not going to blow it. 37-23. Let's move on to Sunday. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tom Brady and company after winning their first game post by they go to Atlanta. Raheem Morris, former Bucks coach, getting a chance to try to convince Arthur Blank to hire him. The Falcons six point underdogs over under 50.5. Chris, who wins this one and by how much? Well, I, I'm going to go with the Bucks here. I, I can't, you know, you, you can't pick the Atlanta Falcons right now with the way they're playing. You know, the offense sputtering every week, really. You know, Tampa Bay. You know, defense is good, maybe not as great as we thought it might be or was early in the year, but it's still good. And the Falcons offense, Matt Ryan, everything about it, yeah, just nothing nothing all that impressive as far as points, yards, plays, what they're doing in clutch moments. All of that is kind of like eh, below average. The Buccaneers, too, the way they played on offense last week, the statistics won't say it, but I thought it was one of their best offensive games of the year. Really were never stopped only stopped on a few third downs because Brady had people around him, and that's the one weakness in Brady's game right now. If he has any sort of people around him, he's he gets stressed out, and you don't know where the ball might go, and that was part of the reason he missed some of those wide-open guys we saw in the early game. 
But when they run the ball, play two tight ends, Mike, I know you've heard me say it before, it makes them a better football team. It allows him to hit play action pass, be camp, uh, comfortable in the pocket, keep a tight end, max protect, block, be comfortable in the pocket. I think this is close. I think the Atlanta Falcons are going to give one more last gasp effort for like Raheem Morris, but it'll be too little too late. I'm going to go Bucks 24-21, a late field goal to win it, Mike. Wow, wow. Another needle threader. Look, I, I, I'm taking the chalk and the chalk to cover. I like the Bucks. I think they figured some things out during the bye week. We saw the changes. LaShawn McCoy in for Leonard Fournette as the third down back. We saw a plummeting of the Antonio Brown participation from 75% to below 50%. I think they're realizing that forcing three and four receivers onto the field doesn't work. And then Scotty Miller, he needs more reps. He was on the pl- on the field last week for five plays, and he had a 48-yard touchdown. Antonio Brown hasn't had a single touchdown during his entire time with the Buccaneers. So I think they're starting to pivot toward what they know will work down the stretch and in the postseason. And speaking of pivoting, Bruce Arians on Wednesday says, I don't know why Tom Brady's getting criticized so much. Bruce, you're the guy that's been criticizing him on and off all year. Don't act surprised now when other people are following your lead. Bottom line is he's now kissing Tom's butt. He knows they're getting closer to the point in the season where – Brady isn't going to be flustered by being in the, the playoffs and having his season ride on it. He's made he's made a, a, a career out of thriving in those settings, and they are they are getting closer and closer to what will be an inevitable playoff berth. I say 31-20 Buccaneers handle the Falcons. They play them twice over the final three weeks, and I think they will win both times. Next up, Jacksonville heads to Baltimore. Jaguars one week one, have lost 12 in a row. Here come the Ravens playing well while desperate. 13 point favorites for the 47 and a half over under Chris. How many points do the Ravens win by? Well, I'm going to go by 14 points. And I think it's going to be a pretty high scoring football game when all said and done. I mean, obviously, we know Baltimore's a better team. So obviously, I expect Lamar Jackson and company to be able to move the ball on the Jaguars' offense. Almost, I mean, defense, almost at will. You know, I would like to see more out of that passing game from Baltimore. It's still scary. I mean, you think about it, Mike. The passing game doesn't deliver much. All his passing yards, the two biggest plays of the night, were really Lamar Jackson scrambling and making things happen, right? I don't think it's going to be sustainable for them to win playoff games unless they get a little more out of that avenue as far as passing game is concerned. But I think the run game is too much for Jacksonville. I think Jacksonville... Gardner Minshew at the helms this week will move the ball and make plays. I mean, over the last five or six weeks, the Baltimore Ravens defense is one of the worst in football. It is statistically. I looked that up. I know. And they can't stop the run. That's been an issue, right? And we know they're going to give you a few chances in man to man coverage. And right now, the only two really good cover guys they got are Humphrey and Peters. So, that third matchup or whatever is an issue for them. I'm going to go 38-24. Ravens, I think the Jaguars score some points and hang around, but ultimately the Ravens put them away late. Yeah, I got 38-20. And as you talk about concerns with the passing game, I just wonder how much confidence Marquise Brown is going to carry away from the touchdown catch and run that, that got the game tied up late. It was the key play of the game when Lamar Jackson returned from the locker room. Will that help the connection between the two as that passing game needs to improve if the Ravens are going to have any hope of advancing in the postseason? Next up on the docket, San Francisco 49ers at the Cowboys. Once upon a time, it was a great game. As we said on PFT Live, the NFL said to the Cowboys, go flex yourself or something like that. Whatever it was, it made you laugh earlier. We both need a couple of laughs today. The Cowboys favored to lose. That's that's called a that's called a, a cover when I when I uh, I was getting that wrong. The 49ers actually three point favorites on the road. Who do you have and how many points will they win by, Chris? Well, I am. I'm going with San Francisco 49ers. Uh, you know, uh, again, I, I understand that Dallas, Ezekiel Elliott, Andy Dalton, the wide receivers, there's something there. I get that they're a little dangerous, definitely. But the 49ers defense is still playing at a pretty high level. You know, I know Josh Allen made some plays a few weeks ago, but man, it's only him and two or three other guys that could have done what, what he did to that 49ers defense. Last week, their defense was phenomenal. I mean, The only problem with last week was their offense was letting up points. I mean, they were giving the ball to the Washington football team left and right. 
That was the issue. I think this is one of those games where Shanahan cracks the code. This is, to me, where it's dangerous for Dallas. Not very good defensively, player-wise. Not very good schematic-wise. That, to me, sets up for Shanahan blowing you out. Dallas, can they move the ball a little? Maybe. But I just think this is one that the 49ers will control throughout. I'm going to go 49ers 31-17, Mike. The fact that the 49ers are sticking with Nick Mullins as the starting quarterback tells me this is going to be a run the ball, run the ball, run the ball game. You know, Shanahan actually said last week that their loss to the Bills featured one of the best performances ever under Shanahan of the running game. The running game is there. The Dallas defense stinks. I'm going to say 27-23. That was the score I picked before I even knew the spread. That's the 49ers winning. That's the 49ers covering, and we're going to go with that one. Let's move on to the next one. The Houston Texans at the Indianapolis Colts. Colts favored by seven, over under a 51. Chris, who wins and by how many? Well, I, again, I mean, how can you pick the Texans? You know, what, what, what are you going to pick there? It all rides on one guy making magic all game long. And within that, you know, it, nobody else – can mess up too badly to where it affects his magic making or they have no chance. The Houston defense, it's, it's pitiful. What else can you really say about it? I think the Colts have found something a little bit on the offensive side of the ball too. I think they're finally realize, realizing a little like Tampa with an older quarterback, right? Where they're going, hey, wait, let's not put everything on our older quarterback all the time. Let's run the football. We got two good backs there. You know, we can do some things off it to make – Life easier for Phillip Rivers. So with that, Colts defense not dominant lately, but still better than the Texans and good enough to give the Texans offense issues. I'm going to go with the Colts, 38-27. Watson will make some plays and hang around, but the Colts will ultimately just wear them down as the game goes. I got 34-24 Colts, a lot of the same reasons you're talking about. And again, the Colts trying to position themselves for the postseason. The Texans simply playing out the string, playing the role of spoiler. I think that urgency to qualify for the postseason and still the uncertainty for the Colts. They could win the division. If they fall apart down the stretch, they won't even be in the playoffs. They need this one. They have to win it, especially with a trip to Pittsburgh in primetime coming up next week. Is it primetime? I don't think it's primetime, but still it's a trip to Pittsburgh coming up in week 16. So 34-24, my pick for that one. Next up, the New England Patriots trying to play spoiler for the Dolphins, the Dolphins a slim two-point favorite at home, which would suggest neutral site. The Patriots would be favored or it would be a push. Kind of shocking, Chris, but we know what Bill Belichick does against young quarterbacks when he gets a crack at them for the first time. Will Bill Belichick be able to solve Tua Tonga-Vailoa and beat the Dolphins? Coin flip football game. I mean, it really is. It, it, I don't mean to, like, cop out, but it, it can be one of those things where it's just whoever makes that big mistake loses the game. I think it's very even. You know, we know the way New England likes to play or has to play to win the football game. they got to run the ball, run the ball really effectively, and they're just going to pick their little spots to when to throw. But where that's an issue is, man, Miami's got a lot of big people up front. they got really good corners on the outside. They should be able to shut down the New England passing game. And, you know, unlike week one where you weren't sure what to expect with Cam Newton running the ball and doing those things in the Miami Dolphins defense, they're going to have a much better feel for how they're going to be attacked this time around. And they're just a better football team. I do worry about Tua in the offense. You know, I think it's a little predictable and all of that. But ultimately, he takes care of the ball. He understands what he needs to do to win a football game. I'm going to ride with the Dolphins here. I, 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 I think they're going to win a tough, close defensive battle, and I just think they got a few more offensive weapons than the New England Patriots, dude, to pull this one out. I'm going to go 20-17 to 17 Dolphins. Wow, so you have the Dolphins winning and covering. See, I tend to think that if the Dolphins win, it's not going to be close. That if it's close, it favors the Patriots, and I think it will be close, and I think the Patriots will win. This is just one of those, even though the Patriots are likely done, Bill Belichick's not ready to fold the tents. He's not going to make it easy for one of his former assistants, and I've got the same score just the other way. Patriots 20, Dolphins 17. This is a find-a-way-to-win-it game plus that factor of Tua 
Number one, being a rookie. Number two, enough film out there for Bill Belichick to come up with a defense that will confuse and confound Tua and force him into making some some mistakes, which I think will happen. Cam Newton. That's what I worry about. Yeah, and Cam Newton. Look, he, he's he's in the. I have to put some film out there that other teams will like because chances are he's going to be playing elsewhere in 2021 and not with the New England Patriots. But who knows? If he finishes strong, maybe the Patriots decide to bring him back. All right, next one. Chicago at Minnesota. Both teams are 6-7. and seven. Both teams are desperate to keep their playoff hopes alive, although I think neither team will ultimately make it. Vikings are a three-point favorite over under a 47. Chris, who wins? Well, I mean, the first time around, I picked the Bears to win an ugly close football game, and it kind of played out that way, and they found a way to mess it up and let Kirk Cousins and company kind of get some momentum late in the football game and win it. You know, the Bears offensively have been better lately. They have. They've definitely changed their approach. Trubisky's been underneath the center more. They've been running the ball, more formations, different personnel sets. I like all that. I do. You know, I don't know where to go with this one. I think it's a very evenly matched football game. I can't imagine Dalvin Cook in the running game having a ton of success. I think about as successful as it gets is what we saw in the first matchup where he had about 30 carries for the high 90s, right? Mike, somewhere in that general vicinity, you know, but I think that's still enough for them to be able to throw the ball on Chicago enough to move the ball. Listen, this one's really close. I'm boiling it down to this. I'm, I'm going Cousins, Zimmer, greater than Trubisky, Nagy, and I'm going to ride with that in a game that I look at as very evenly matched, and I'm just going to take those two over the other two. What's your score? I'm going – oh, I'm right on the spread again here. So let me change this. I'm going to go 20 to 16 Vikings. I have Bears 23, Vikings 20, and my reasoning is very simple. Earlier this year when they played on Monday night and Nick Foles was the quarterback, the Bears offense couldn't do anything. They had opportunities early to establish right. themselves, score some points, and put the Vikings into more of a desperation mode where they abandon the run, and Kirk Cousins tries to throw, and he gets swallowed up by the Chicago – pass rush. Mitchell Trubisky has done well against the Vikings. Now he's gotten injured twice against the Vikings in Chicago, but he's played well against Minnesota. And I think back to the last game of the 2018 regular season when all the Vikings had to do was win and they were in the playoffs. The Bears already had clinched the division title. They weren't playing for anything and the Vikings still couldn't win that game. And Trubisky ran well against the Vikings defense back when they had a pass rush. Now they don't really have a pass rush. I think Trubisky, if guys aren't open, and they very well may be with that overmatched Vikings secondary, especially at corner. If they aren't open, he can run the ball. And Cordell Patterson has an extra level of juice when it's time to play the Vikings. I think the Bears win this one 23-20 and put a fork in the Vikings' rear end. He loves him. He loves him not. And That's this right. Is the I feel this good. Is now that you picked the Bears, I almost feel like, oh, this is per I'm going to win now. It's perfect. I just this know. Is the, this is the this weekend is where – now, this is the weekend where I can say, wait till next year for uh, the, the the latest time in a chain that is unbroken for 45 years. You Detroit know, just at real, Tennessee. Over, just real quietly, though, just to say this, dude, sorry, just the Vikings defense been pretty damn good lately. That's where I gave, they gave me just enough confidence to say, okay, I think they could stop Trubisky's running and all that, but we'll see. Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. Lions at the Titans. The Titans need to keep winning to win the division, get to the postseason. Ten and a half points spread in that one for the Titans. But the Lions, we don't know if it's going to be Matthew Stafford or Chase Daniel at quarterback. Chris, who wins and by how many? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a huge, like, difference. I mean, Matthew Stafford to Chase Daniel. Whoa. Okay. Like, that's if, – if it's Chase Daniel, all right, I'll just say this. The Titans blow them out, annihilate them, 38-17, something like that. If it's Matt Stafford, I'll go 38-27, all right, somewhere in that range. And I'm, gonna, I'm picking it right now as if Matt Stafford's going to play because he usually does. This is, this is what he's done a lot throughout his career. That Titans defense, we know, not very good. The Lions have balance on the offense. You know, they're going to be able to run the ball enough to where the Titans have to worry about that. And then we know the Titans can't cover on the back end. And Stafford and his ability to throw and make plays with his right arm, it's still special that way. 
So I can see them moving the ball, but ultimately it's the Lions defense that's sucky ducky, all right? And they're not going to be able to stop the Titans. The Titans offense, it's the most explosive ground and pound offense I've ever seen in my life. I mean, with all the big runs, and then when they throw the ball, Mike, I mean, I know we kind of like are in amazement every week where we just go, when they throw it, it's 20 or 40 yard completions on the regular. It's amazing what they do. So yeah, I'm going Titans 38-27. You haven't broken out sucky ducky in a long time. A long time, right? It's been a while. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Glad you noticed. Uh, uh, I'm, and and, and here, here's what I think of the Lions. When I typed up my scores and picks, I actually put Titans 31, Jaguars 13. So I, so I regard the Lions in pretty much the same category as the Jaguars, even though the Jaguars are 1-12 and 12 and the Lions are 5-8. and 31-13 is the score I'm going with, regardless of whether or not Matthew Stafford plays. The question for me is, does Derrick Henry – get enough yards on the ground against the Titan against the Lions defense. So when we go into the last couple of games, he's at least within reasonable shouting distance of the all-time single Could season happen. 105. He needs to average 191 a game. If he gets 190 or 200, then we go into the last two saying hey, all he needs is, you know, 180, 190 a game over the last two weeks and maybe he can maybe we'll get some quotes from Eric Dickerson where he's trying to put some sort of a hex on Derrick Henry so he doesn't break a record that stood since 1984. Last early game, Seattle, which loves to come across the country and play at those 10 a.m. body clock games, a five-point favorite at Washington. Chris, who do you have? Well, I mean, I'm going to go with the Seattle Seahawks. I am. You know, two, two reasons. One, hey, we don't know the situation for the football team's quarterback right now, but either way, it doesn't sway me a lot no matter what. Hey, I like their chances better if Alex Smith plays because I do trust that he won't make mistakes. And the plays that are there to be had, for the most part, he's going to take advantage of that. But they're offensively challenged there with the Washington football team. And the biggest thing is with no Antonio Gibson, they've become, you know, really offensively challenged. They, it, it, it just finding ways to move the ball consistently are hard. And, of course, Terry McLaurin's the only guy you got to be worried about on that offense. Now, we know the Washington defense is special, too. There's no doubt. But that Seattle defense has played well lately, and I have a hard time thinking Washington gets much yardage points or anything on that Seattle defense. Same goes on the other side. I don't expect Seattle to be moving the ball up and down the field on the Washington football team either. I don't. I think it'll be tough sledding. But I just think ultimately – Running the ball enough, the weapons, Russell Wilson and company, they'll find a few ways to score. And I just think that also that Washington offense will end up wearing the Washington defense out by not staying on the field and sustaining drives and doing that. I'm going Seahawks 24 to 13. You know, I originally had 27-20 Seattle. I'm looking at the over-under. To the extent that anyone relies upon my total score projection in making an over-under bet, first of all, I feel sorry for you. But second of all, I don't want to mislead you. I think this will be under. I'm going to go, instead of 27-20, I'm going to go 24-17, which if my math is correct, and it rarely is, is under 44 and a half. I think as we discussed earlier today on PFT Live, the key is going to be to play it carefully on offense. Don't give the Washington defense a chance to get the ball and have Chase Young run it to the end zone, Walter Payton style, holding that football out there like he did on that long run. Be careful. Right. Be smart. It's not let, let Russ cook. It's let Russ crock pot. That's what they need to do on Sunday against Washington. If they do that, they'll win. And I think Pete Carroll and Brian Schottenheimer are smart enough to make that happen. 24-17, my pick for Seattle to win the game and maybe get closer to a division title. What do you got? Uh, but but you said it. That's right. I mean, that, that's what he needs. He needs to play ultra conservative. He's got to go into the game realizing, like, the only way we lose is if I make dumb mistakes and I take stupid sacks and strip sack fumbles and interceptions and all that. And I think he will realize that. I do. I'd be shocked if he doesn't understand the full scope of what's, what needs to happen in this football game. It's a lost art in football. I think Seattle is one of those teams that's willing to do it, right? New England's another one of those teams where they'll do whatever they have to do just to win the game. They don't care how it looks. And so many teams in football don't do that. They just go, oh, we're going to do what we do against this team. Oh, yeah? Well, how did that work out, Pittsburgh and San Francisco versus the Washington football team? You have to adjust to that opponent to just win that game. 
Not like, oh, it's got to look great and cool and sexy. You know, nobody knows or cares when the season's over or what it was. All right, we have to take a break. When we return, the late afternoon games from Sunday of Week 15, including Chief Saints, plus a former Oklahoma quarterback and the guy who replaced him once he went to the NFL. We got that and much more coming up here on PFTPM and Chris Sims Unbuttoned, the weekly Mega Picks podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the joint production of PFTPM, Chris Sims Unbuttoned, presented by Verizon. Things are a little bit different today because of technical issues. I've got this microphone I'm trying to not knock over. And I don't know what to do with my arms. I've had to lower my chair, Chris, because I had to lift up the camera on my laptop. I, f I feel like I'm sitting at the kids' table today. Uh, well, you, but, would, I, uh, you can't tell. I mean, you can't tell sitting here, you know, watching right now. But yeah. Elbows I mean, up, though. Elbows up. And uh, I don't know where to put my arms because it's like I, it's not it's not there's not a natural resting spot. Anyway, enough of our extremely first world problems as we try to navigate the program today. It's time for the 4 p.m. games for the 15th Sunday of the 2020 regular season. Let's begin with the Philadelphia Eagles and the Arizona Cardinals, former Oklahoma quarterbacks, although Jalen Hurts was just there for a year after he transferred from Alabama. He replaced Kyler Murray. Hurts was great last week in his debut, over 100 rushing yards. Kyler Murray hasn't had over 50 rushing yards in four straight weeks. He's had that shoulder thing. The Cardinals dug deep and beat the Giants on the road. Now they've got the Eagles coming to town. Both teams are desperate. Cardinals favored by six, over under 49 and a half. Chris, who wins and by how many? Well, well, you know, one, unlike the Saints, I expect the Arizona Cardinals to have a plan for Jalen Hurts. And I think... You know, ultimately, their defensive personnel is more suited to stop a guy like Jalen Hurts than I think the New Orleans Saints. You know, the one thing the Cardinals have is a lot of fast guys at the second level. You know, they got a lot of really athletic linebackers. The Hassan Reddicks, the Justin Simmons, the Jordan Hicks, the Devondre Campbells. These are linebackers that are all like run 4-4, four, 4-5 four, four, type of speed. So I think they'll be able to contain him when he scrambles. I think they'll have proper spies as far as somebody there when he does drop back to pass. And because they deal with their own running quarterback in that, I think they'll have a pretty good clue on how to stop the Jalen Hurts designed run game as well. And you flip it around on the other side, we know Philadelphia's defense pretty damn good. They like to play a lot of man-to-man, -man, okay? And that to me is a little scary sometimes against the Cardinals. The Cardinals, that's where Kyler Murray can go off in the run game, Mike. Where, you know, hey, this guy's covering the back. This guy's covering the tight end. He fakes to the back, and he goes that way, and the tight end goes this way. And all of a sudden, the guy they thought was going to be on the edge there for Kyler Murray is not there. They can cross you up with what they do behind the line of scrimmage. And Arizona will run the football. And they're not the best run defense in Philadelphia that way. So because of that, I'm going to go Cardinals 27-17. Uh, I think the Eagles will have a hard time moving the ball consistently and scoring points in this one. We've almost picked the identical score. I went 26-17 just for variety. Who knows how many points are ultimately going to be scored. We're in the same range, though. And that's a great point that the Cardinals' defense knows how – to chase around a mobile quarterback. They deal right. with it all the time in practice when you've got ones versus ones. And so Russell Wilson yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. And they deal with Russell Wilson twice a year. So they're not going to be freaked out. And, and the, the saints have provided a valuable lesson to anyone who's going to face Jalen hurts and the Eagles have a game plan for a guy who's mobile. Now, maybe this week they try to flip it around, but Hey, we'll see if Jalen hurts can throw the ball. If the Eagles deliberately choose not to run it. So I agree with you. I think the Cardinals prevail. They continue to move toward getting to the postseason. They will be a fun team to watch in the postseason. I don't know how successful they'll be, but they'll definitely be fun to watch. Next up, a game that will be fun to watch for no one except even the most ardent Rams fan that just wants to watch their team kick around a team that should be relegated to the CFL if the CFL even still exists. The Jets at the Rams. The Rams a 17-point favorite with an over-under of 43.5. Chris, how bad will this one be for the Jets? Well, I mean, I expect them to cover. I, I do. I mean, I didn't even think twice about that. I really didn't. It's just like, okay, where do we think the limit is as far as what the Jets can score points? I mean, I think like if they have like one of their best games of the year, it could be like 17 points. 
total. And then on the defensive side of the ball, like, you know, what are you going to uh, – the Jets' defense, it's, it's an okay. It's a solid unit. But we've seen the Rams and Cam Akers, they got to go in a little bit. You know, and that makes them dangerous, of course, with everything else they do off of the McVay offense. And then Jared Goff, when you play that way, he plays really well off of it too. So I just have a hard time thinking the Jets can move the ball at all. This is a scary matchup for them as far as their offense versus this defense. I think they're going to have a hard time doing anything. Their defense might be able to hang in there for a little bit, but ultimately it's going to get worn down. 31-10 Rams all the way. This reminds me of a of a, a boxing match where one side is thrown in the towel, but the fight keeps going. That's where yeah, I feel right. like the Jets are this year. They're done. They don't care. They just don't care. I think what we saw in Seattle is what it's going to be the rest of the way. They don't care. Adam Gase knows what's coming, whether from Christopher Johnson or Woody Johnson. And it's just a question of how ugly these last three games get. 17 is too low of a spread. I think the Rams will destroy them. I've got 42-17, which is being charitable to the Jets. I don't know how they score 17 points against this Rams defense, which will feast on Sam Darnold and company. Hell, Aaron Donald, after seeing Hassan Reddick get five sacks last week, I could see Aaron Donald try to get six or seven on his own, and maybe he'll pull it off. So this one's going to be ugly, and that's all we need to say about that. The game of the day. Chiefs at the Saints. It would be better if we knew Drew Brees was playing. He most likely won't be. Taysom Hill for his fifth consecutive start. That's exactly how many games Drew Brees didn't play in 2020. They were 5-0 and this year. They're 3-1. and run. The Chiefs coming to town. Three-point favorites. The line has dropped. It has moved. It has... Uh, I'm getting you a got a phone call, call, huh? Who you got? You get a Who's phone calling call. you? Let's the go line on. has moved. Uh, and now it's three points that the, uh, that the Chiefs are favored. Chris... Do the Chiefs win? Do the Chiefs cover? Well, yeah, I expect the Chiefs to win the football game. I do. I, I think, you know, I, I, I love the New Orleans Saints defense. I do. It's really good. You know, they haven't played an offense like this all year long, though. And really, the only thing you can make even comparable is like Aaron Rodgers and, and the Green Bay offense. So, they had their success. Now, I know it's been a, a long time, but this is Kansas City. This is a Saints team that's got a good pass rush, but it's not a special pass rush. They will play aggressive on the back end, the Saints at times, and give you one-on-one -on -one opportunities and things like that. That's what scares me. So, yeah, I think that Saints defense is really good, but I still don't think it's going to be good enough that it's going to, like, stop the Chiefs and company from scoring less than 30. I don't. I still expect the Chiefs to move the ball and make a number of big plays. The big thing is the other side of the ball. Can the Saints offense keep pace? I do expect the Saints offense to be able to run the ball with some sort of success, you know, but the one thing too is the Chiefs are going to – when you're a team that they're scared of one thing, like we saw in the AFC Championship last year or, you know, even Josh Jacobs a few weeks ago with the Raiders, if they are worried about the run, they can stop the run. If, if they want to win the Saints I'm talking about this game, this is a game where I look at it where I go, it's going to have to be with Taysom Hill's right arm. I don't think they're going to get away with him, like, running the ball and them scoring 30-plus points that way. I don't. So there, I haven't seen enough of that. I don't trust that. It's Mahomes in Kansas City. I'm going Chiefs 34-28 on the road. I've got 34-27, almost the identical score again, and I agree with you. Look, it's got to be a high-scoring game for the Saints to have a chance. We've got to see Taysom Hill throwing the football. This could be a game where the Saints actually feel better about Taysom Hill on the other end of it. And if the Saints somehow would win this one, that would be great. But what we've seen about the Chiefs is one of the key ingredients in beating them, you need to catch them napping. You're not going to catch them napping when they're going into New Orleans to take on a Saints team that is trying to reposition itself as the number one seed. And I think what will happen as a practical matter here, Packers win Saturday, Saints lose Sunday, the Packers will essentially have the number one seed wrapped up and the Saints at some point will have to go to Lambeau Field, which is not good news for the New Orleans Saints to have to go outdoors in the elements in January. Let's take a break. The primetime games coming up. Browns, Giants, and the potential revenge of Freddie Kitchens. We'll be back with more PFTPM and Chris Sims on Button right after this.
PFTPM, Chris Sims on button time to get into the primetime games presented by Verizon. And for Sunday night, a game that the NFL wisely chose to move from the afternoon to the evening, the Cleveland Browns and the New York Giants, an old school feel. Boy, it would be great if it would snow during the game. The Browns, after that epic Monday night loss to the Ravens, although a lot of people gaining respect for the Browns, me included, in that effort. The Giants, who knows who the quarterback's going to be. We know the offensive coordinator won't be Jason Garrett. Freddie Kitchens will be calling the plays for the Giants, the ultimate revenge opportunity against the team that fired him after one year. Although it's really not revenge. He stunk. He got what he deserved. Now he gets a chance to show he's learned something in his year away from Cleveland. Chris, the Browns are a five-point favorite with an over-under of 44. What's the final score of this one? Old school matchup. I do love it. There will be snow on the ground. I can tell you that, Mike. I mean, it's, we're getting towards two feet here in the Northeast. So it might not be on the field, but you'll see at least shoveled off to the side to give that effect, right, of like the old 1950s matchups of the Giants and Browns. Um, cool things with, hey, Daniel Jones, Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield kind of talked crap about him last year. We got the Freddie Kitchens thing. There's the Odell Beckham trade history here with these two teams and all of that. You know, Jabril Peppers was on that Cleveland Browns team. Zeitler, the guard, was on that Browns team. So there's some personal aspects of this. And I think on the field, hey, listen, Cleveland's a better football team. But as we always talk about, it's a matchup league. I think the Giants match up very well with the Cleveland Browns. Now, the Daniel Jones injury is concerning to me because – they are not the most, you know, exciting offensive football team out there. They need him to scramble and a few of his read option run plays help out their run offense and their team in a lot of ways too. You can run the ball on Cleveland. And I would expect the Giants to be able to run on them with some success with or without Daniel Jones. Of course, more if he's in there. But that's dicey. On the other side of the ball, man, Mike, that Giants D-line, I think they can stop that Browns running game to a degree. You know, they're well coached, they're big, they're pretty good in the secondary, but ultimately, you know, the Browns are rolling, and I think Baker Mayfield's rolling, and I think the run game, even if you slow it down, is effective enough to open up everything they want to do on the offensive side of the ball, and I don't trust the Daniel Jones situation. Close one, I'm going to go Browns 23-17. Yeah, you know, this one is is one of the toughest ones of the week for me to pick. I, I've I've – not given the Giants their proper due this year. I got locked into the early season narrative, and I didn't want to let it go, even though they have gotten better. Baker Mayfield has gotten better before our eyes. He spoke yesterday to reporters about the confidence that he's feeling, and he gets better the more confident that he feels. So as you get better and you feel more confident, you get more confident and you get better. He also said that the Browns players want to win this one for Odell Beckham Jr., even though he's not going to be playing. Obviously, he had the torn ACL from Week 7 against the Bengals. I, I like the Browns in this one, and I'm going to say Browns 30, Giants 20. I don't feel all that confident about it. I just feel like the Browns are rising to the moment. Last week, we had two teams in the Giants and the Browns with an opportunity to rise to the moment against a playoff contender. The Giants didn't and the Browns did. And to me, that counts for something this week. The Browns have it figured out, and the Browns, I think, are going to be desperate and anxious to get back on the field and show that they can recover from that emotional loss. I love what Kevin Stefanski's done. A couple of Coach of the Year candidates going against each other. I think Stefanski and the Browns emerge with the victory 30-20, to 20, Chris, although I don't feel great about it, especially if Daniel Jones plays and if he can move around at all. Right, right. No, I, I think that, that'll be a big aspect of the football game. But I think you you hit it pretty spot on. And, you know, we had that talk for a while like, oh, if they can't run the ball, can Baker Mayfield make enough plays throwing the ball to help them win games? And I think he's answered that question now. I do. You know, I think it, it, he, he can, yes. And he's feeling confident. They are a team on the rise. And, yeah, even though they lost last week, I feel better about what I saw from them as compared to the Ravens who won the game which was just all Lamar Jackson making plays by himself. So uh, we'll see how it goes, but I'm with you. I expect the Browns to win this one. The bye week was the turning point for the Browns offense because when you think about it, no offseason program, no preseason games. That was a chance to go back and see what they had done wrong, what they'd done right, and improve. And since then, Mayfield has been very good. He's had his first career back-to-back 300-yard -back passing games the last two weeks. All right, Monday Night Football.
Not quite as compelling as last week, but hey, that's what you get late in the season. You never know how these teams are going to be. The Steelers, although reeling a little bit after losing two in a row, they need to reestablish. They finally get a normal week to prepare, plus a day. They are at Cincinnati, 13-point favorites with an over-under of only 40.5. Chris, I assume you're picking the Steelers to win. The question is, do you pick the Steelers to cover? Well, yeah, of course I expect them to win. Now, Bengals defense, a little bit of a pain in the butt. They are. You know, their, their one big issue is, like, they can't stop the run. Well, they're playing a team that can't run the ball. So, and Pittsburgh, as we know, you know, my phrase of the week is, be, you know, they've become predictable within their predictability, or predictability within their predictableness, whatever the hell I'm trying to say. But I, ultimately, yes, I don't have any faith in the Bengals offense. And I got to think that Pittsburgh goes back to the lab here and infuses something new in their offense, whether that is the run game or more formations in the pass game, maybe keeping tight ends in to block so Big Ben can throw the ball down the field so they're not so predictable in the double whammy of, hey, we throw it every play and we throw it every play six yards or less. They got to start making defenses defend more of the field. That's a concern for me for them going forward. But I don't see this being an issue. I got them covering. I'm going to go 27-13. I just don't have enough faith in that Bengals offense to consistently move the ball in that Steelers D. Great game for the Steelers to reestablish themselves and figure out what their identity is going to be down the stretch and into the playoffs. And having that extra time to prepare any normal week for a change should matter. Plus the primetime focus after they lost on Sunday night, a chance to convince people and themselves that they will be a serious contender when January rolls around, regardless of whether or not they will be. Because if they run into the Ravens right out of the gates, it could be one and done for the Steelers this year. But I've got Pittsburgh 34-17, to winning and covering, and just barely over, although, trust me, I don't feel strong about that at all. When we return, the games about which we feel the strongest this week, best bets plus the one game straight up that we guarantee will produce a winner. We'll do that when PFTPM and Chris Sims Unbuttoned conclude right after this. All right, wrapping up this edition of PFTPM and Chris Sims Unbuttoned, we do our joint Mega Picks podcast every Thursday during the season. We've got our best bets and a new feature. Now, Pete Demolitis has been calling it the survivor pick. I view it as the Folsom Prison Blues pick. Here's why. In the excellent movie Walk the Line, when Johnny Cash, played by Joaquin Phoenix, is playing some tired old gospel song, the producer says to him, you're lying dead in the ditch and you got one song to play. It's That's not the song you're going to play. And he plays Folsom Prison Blues for the first time. So one pick that we're going to make. We'll wrap up the podcast with that. So I'm going to keep calling it the Folsom Prison Blues pick. Chris, whether anyone likes it or not. What's your first best bet of the week? Uh, I'm going to go to the Cowboys 49ers football game. The 49ers have burned me on best bets, but this is a week I just believe that they can't burn me. All right, I do. I just think with Shanahan, the offense, I know some people stand that Cowboys defense and the 49ers defense been playing pretty good football lately. With all that said, I just don't see how the Cowboys keep it close. I think Shanahan and company cracked the code here. I'm going 31-17 49ers as one of my best bets. We have pulled the arm on the slot machine, and we've got 49ers locked in on one line, and we've got 49ers locked in on the next one. We're doing it again. It didn't work last week, but we're doing it again. I got the 49ers as well, Chris. What's your second one? My second one, and I'm going with the Seattle Seahawks. You know, I just look at that game at Washington, and by the grin on your face, it looks like you might go there as well. But I, I, I'm, I think Seattle knows what they're dealing with in the Washington defense. You know, Seattle, of course, Russell Wilson played with a defense like that. He understands what needs to be done with a dominant defense, how he has to take care of the ball and take calculated risks every now and then when the opportunity presents itself. But I think. Seattle running the ball a little better lately, Russell Wilson, and then really just the the ineptitude of the Washington football team offense with no Antonio Gibson. I don't care who's at quarterback. Uh, Seattle's defense has been better lately. I like Seattle. Ineptitude is the key for my next pick. The Jets have stumbled to a level of ineptitude I've never seen before. The Rams cover the 17-point spread. What's your last one? 
Well, mine too. I'm going with you there as well. I, I just don't look at it and look at it in a lot of ways and go, the, the biggest thing is how do the Jets move the ball? You know, they're not good at any one phase uh, of the of the game on the offensive side of the ball. The Rams are awesome at run defense and pass defense. They can pressure the quarterback. They don't have to blitz. Those receivers for the Jets are not very good. They'll be able to lock them down. And even though I got a little respect for the Jets defense, they're ultimately going to get worn down by being on the field and McVay and that Rams offense. So I don't see – I'm with you. Rams all the way. I may regret this. I'm going with the Chiefs for my third pick. When they're locked in, when they're focused, they are dangerous. They're going to win by seven in my estimation. So that covers the three points. All right, real quickly, Chris, because we're almost out of time. What's your Folsom Prison pick? I assume it's the Rams. Well, yes, of course it is. I mean, the, the Jets are playing. We might as well just book that for the next three weeks. That's, that's it. <laughs> All right, uh, that is it for this edition of PFTPM and Chris Sims Unbuttoned. Enjoy the games. We'll see you next time. See ya. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.